We already gave a delay of game warning. So let's assess a tactical foul now. No, they must be assessed when they occur. Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Basketball Rules Expert, where we take the rules off the printed page, breathe life into them, amplify, clarify, and simplify, and then give them back to you in an audiovisual format so you can take them with you onto the basketball court. Greetings, everyone. My name is Greg Austin with abetterofficial.com. I've been a high school basketball official for over a decade, and I'm a basketball rules expert. This show is all about helping you become a basketball rules expert as well. Before we get started with today's episode, shout outs to show supporters, Clay Vickery and Larone Smith. Thank you. Also, super supporters of the show, Tony Dye and Paul Sullivan. Much appreciated and much love. If you want to support the show, you can always buy us a coffee. The link is is above. All right, let's get started with today's episode. Again, this is a four-part series on technical fouls in National Federation of High School Basketball Rules. Our first episode was on administrative technical fouls. If you missed that episode, there is a link above. Before we get started today on substitute technicals and team technicals, let's just have a brief overview of technical fouls. First of all, all technical fouls in National Federation of High School rules count towards the team foul count towards bonus. Each technical foul, whether it be administrative, team technical, substitute technical, player technical, or bench technical, each technical counts towards the team foul count. In addition, all of the individuals involved with a team, be they team members, a member of the coaching staff, other personnel, other bench personnel, such as team managers, statisticians, just other bench personnel, each individual, if they receive one flagrant tactical foul, they are either ejected or disqualified. If any of those individuals receive two technical fouls, they are either disqualified or ejected. Students are disqualified to the bench area. Adults are ejected, meaning they must leave the vicinity promptly and not have contact with the team for the remainder of the game. So that's an overview of the penalties now today we're going to talk about two areas, substitute technical foul and team technical foul. Rule 10, section 3, substitute technical foul. A substitute shall not enter the court, Article 1, without reporting to the scorer, and Article 2, without being beckoned by an official, except between quarters and during timeouts. The penalty is two free throws plus the ball for division line throw-in. That's the penalty for all tactical fouls. One foul for either or both requirements. So we can't get a double whammy here. A substitute who runs from the bench onto the floor, does, doesn't, doesn't report to the table, and is not beckoned. There's only one penalty. But also notice that it is penalized if discovered before the ball becomes live. Once the ball becomes live, that substitute is a legal player in the game. And our window for penalizing has closed. That's another important f aspect of technical fouls in general. There is a window in which penalty can be assessed. And sometimes we may miss that window. We'll get to that when we cover team technical. A substitute must always report to the table. They may all, must also be beckoned onto the court except after a timeout or an intermission. So a timeout is granted. Players go to their benches. Substitutes 
during the timeout may go to the table and report. Once they report, they are in the game. And there is no administration by the officials to officially bring them into the game. If a player enters the game illegally as a substitute, once the ball becomes live, the opportunity to penalize has passed. One other factor when it comes to a substitute technical is we are talking about bench personnel. When we get to bench, bench technical fouls, we will learn that the head coach is responsible for the actions of bench personnel. What this substitute technical does is it removes that responsibility from the head coach. If a team member becomes a substitute, goes to the table and reports, or fails to report, violates either one of these articles, it is a substitute technical. It goes against that team member or that player, and it does not indirectly go to the head coach. They are not responsible for these, these two actions, okay? Let's be specific about that. There is two actions by the team member. The team member failed to report to the scorer or the team member entered the court without being beckoned. If they violate one of those, they are assessed a substitute technical. If they, do, if they have some other activity that warrants a technical foul, then it is not a substitute technical foul. So let's be really specific about that. Substitute technical is very narrow. Fails to report to the scorer, is not beckoned onto the court except during a timeout or an intermission. All right, let's move on to team technical fouls. Before we get started with section one, let's review the four official warnings for delay. There are four. We need to know these. Rule four, the highest priority rule for new officials to learn. Rule four, section 47, warning for delay. Well, let's read the definition. A warning to a team for delay is an administrative procedure by an official which is recorded into the scorebook by the scorer and reported to the head coach. Always important those two steps are followed. Article 1, for a throw-in plain violations, as in 9.2.10 and 10-2-1c. We covered that in our coverage of throw-in violations. The defenders are not allowed to penetrate the boundary plane with any part of their body. When they do, the official may administer a delay of game warning to the team. Article 2, for huddle by either team and contact with the free thrower, as in 10-2-1D. NFHS does not want teams huddling in the lane during free throw activity, either the offensive team huddling with the thrower or the defensive team huddling. If either team does that, they are liable to receive a delay of game warning. Article 3, for interfering with the ball following a goal, as in 2-10-1E. Ball goes in the basket. The team that just scored bats the ball in a fashion that delays the game, makes it harder for the thrower to get to the ball, potentially allows the defense to set up a press, etc. But interfering with the ball after a goal. Sometimes player, uh, teams will catch the ball and throw it to the official, etc. All of these things make the team liable for a delay of game warning. Article 4, for failure to have the court ready for play following any timeout, as in 10-2-1F. If either team does anything to the court during a timeout that creates a situation for delay, Almost always, this involves spilled fluids onto the floor, which have to be cleaned up. They are liable for a delay of game warning. So we have four delay of game warnings. Throw in plain violation, 
defensive defensive player during a throw in any part of the body through the boundary plane huddling before a free throw for either team huddling in the lane area before a free throw interfering with the ball after a made goal or not having the court ready for promptly resuming play after a timeout each of those four may incur a delay of game warning now let's move on to rule 10 Section 2, Team Technical Fouls. Article 1. Allow the game to develop into an actionless contest. This includes the following and similar acts. A. When the clock is not running, consuming a full minute through not being ready when it is time to start either half. Usually this will occur after halftime. Teams go to their respective locker rooms. 10 minutes is put on the clock. The 10 minutes expires and one of the teams is not present. In that situation, rather than use resumption of play, the officials are instructed to put have the timer put one minute on the clock so we can see if they delay the start of the half by one minute. And if they do, a team technical foul is assessed. If they return during that one minute and they do not delay the game for more than a minute, then there is no technical foul. So it is a team tactical to delay either the start of the game or the second half for more than a minute. C. Commit a violation of the throw-in boundary plane, as in 9-2-10, after any team warning for delay. Okay, we've covered the four warnings for delay. And now we have four clauses of this rule, which say you took this action after you had had a team warning for delay. These four actions are the actions that earn a team a warning for delay. In National Federation of High School Basketball Rules, if you have a delay of game warning for any of the four reasons, and you commit an act that is one of the four warning for delay actions, any of the four, it doesn't have to be the same. So in the first period, we spilled water on the floor during a 30 second timeout, received a delay of game warning. In the second period, a player reached through the boundary plane. So they committed one of the actions after they had already had a delay of game warning. So C, commit a violation of the boundary of the, th- commit a violation of the throw in boundary plane as in 9-2-10 after any team warning for delay. D, contact with the free thrower or huddle of two or more players in the lane by either team prior to the free throw following any team warning for delay. E, interfering with the ball following a goal after any team warning for delay. And F, not having the court ready for play following a timeout after any warning for delay. So it's commonly thought of as receiving a second delay of game warning. We actually don't provide a second delay of game warning. We just assess a team technical foul. So that's Article 1. Article 2, have more than five players participating simultaneously. Six players on the court. That is a team technical by rule, to have six players on the court. Pretty straightforward. Article 3, request an excess timeout. Part of the official's responsibility is to inform a coach when they have used their final timeout. You've used your final timeout. If, after a team is out of timeouts, they request a timeout, it is a team technical. If that request comes from a player or from the head coach, in all instances, it is a team technical. It's not on the player. It's not on the coach, team technical foul. Article four, 
commit an unsporting foul. As a team technical clause, this must refer to some activity of the team that, that multiple players do simultaneously, or in theory, there is, it is possible to issue a technical foul related to the crowd. It's suggested that it be used extremely rarely, but that is a possibility. Those would be examples of unsporting action as a team. Article 5. Fail to have all players return to the court at approximately the same time following a timeout or intermission. That's the key. Following a timeout or intermission, not a substitute situation. There's a case play about a lengthy delay for substitutes. Players get confused. We end up with four players on the court. This is after a timeout or intermission. To not have five players on the court, team tactical foul. So Article 6, allow players to lock arms or grasp teammates in an effort to restrict the movement of an opponent. I've never seen it. But it's a thing. So in theory, you could create a human shield of teammates who lock arms, protect, you know, forming a semicircle around a player and prevent defensive players from getting within six feet and therefore initiating a closely guarded count. I've never seen it, but that's a thing. If you do that, that's a team tactical foul. All right, now penalties. And this is really a critical part of this equation. Remember that each Tactical foul has a window of time in which a penalty can be assessed. As with all tactical fouls, the penalty is two free throws and the ball for a division line throw in. One team foul is added to the team foul count towards bonus, as with all tactical fouls. Okay, for articles one, four, five, and six, it is penalized when they occur. So when they occur, that's our window, right? When the ball becomes live again, our window has closed. So when they occur, a team has been given a warning for delay. They do some activity. That is one of the four areas where a warning for delay can be issued. And maybe the officials issue a second warning for delay erroneously. The ball is put in play. Baskets are, are made, the game moves on, then the officials realize, hey, wait a minute. We already gave a delay of game warning, so let's assess a tactical foul now. No, they must be assessed when they occur. So when they occur, request an excess timeout when it occurs. So all of those delay of game warning scenarios when they occur, that is the window of time we have to assess the technical foul. For Article 2, penalized if discovered while being violated. Article 2 is six players on the court. If discovered when violated, team tactical. If we have a situation where there are six players on the court, even if the ball is live, the ball becomes dead, Coach requests a timeout. Teams go to their bench. The other coach says, hey, they had six players on the floor. Do they have six players on the floor now? No. It's too late to penalize. Not a great situation, but our window of opportunity is while it's occurring. If it's after it occurred, it's too late. All right, that is going to wrap it up for episode two of our series on tactical fouls and National Federation of High School Basketball Rules. Today we covered substitute tactical, realize how limited in scope it is, and team tactical foul. All the situations where a team tactical can be called. And just like with administrative, substitute tacticals and team tackle tacticals are not the responsibility of the head coach. All technical fouls count towards the team foul count towards bonus. They all Each individual is liable if they get a second technical foul to be disqualified or ejected or a single flagrant technical foul for being disqualified or injected. Students 
are disqualified to the bench area. Adults are ejected and must leave the premises immediately and not have contact with the team for the remainder of the game. I really appreciate you sticking around to the end of the video. As we do with every episode, we have created a quiz. It's in the show notes. The link is above. And of course, as always, if you want to be a show supporter, you can always buy us a coffee at abetterofficial.com slash coffee. We've got additional video content for you here. There's a link up here to the first video in the series, if you haven't seen that already. In either event, choose your video, choose wisely, and we'll see you in the next video.